Well, 71 years ago, Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay were the first people to reach the top of Mount Everest. Lots of folks had tried before. There had been there was sort of this slow race uh, from different countries to try to get the first team to the top of Mount Everest, but they, they succeeded 71 years ago, and, and right away they became sort of instant celebrities. They were the, the talk of the world, the freshly crowned Queen of England, uh, knighted uh, Edmund uh, right away, Sir Edmund, and, and they had all these interviews, and in one of the interviews one, one of the questions asked of them was, do you think anybody else will follow? Do you think anybody else will, will climb Mount Everest again? And they said, no, I don't, it was painful. You know, people have died trying to do this. this is terrible. Uh, and it's been done. And so uh, they thought nobody else would risk following uh, up the mountain to, to climb Mount Everest. And they just couldn't have been more wrong. It, it sort of depends on who you read. The statistics evidently are not uh, super clear, at least from my brief research into this, but over the last 70 years or so, somewhere between 4,000 and 6,500 people have climbed Mount Everest, and, and lots of them were trying to be the first to do something, the first woman to climb Mount Everest, the first person to climb Mount Everest backwards evidently was a thing. I'm not I don't know how that went, but evidently that was a deal. And, and so lots and lots, thousands of people have followed that trail blazed by uh, uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay. And, and uh, along with those thousands of people, they've brought tons, literally tons of garbage uh, this, uh, the, the su southern call, 26,000 feet in, in the air uh, on the mountain, is, has been described as the highest garbage dump in the world, F filled with cans and tents and rope and oxygen bottles and even a few dead bodies. It's reached the point where the country of Nepal has uh, started an initiative to try to, to carry off of the mountain 22,000 pounds of garbage. If you want to climb Mount Everest today, if you're on a list and you want to go, uh, there's a $4,000 deposit that you have to pay to climb the mountain, and you get this deposit back if you bring down the mountain 18 pounds of stuff. That's the average amount of trash that somebody leaves behind when they climb uh, the, the mountain. I suppose there's lots of ways to, to think about this. Certainly, you know, if, if uh, you were a Boy Scout, every good Boy Scout knows you ought to leave the place the same way you found it, you know, to, to carry out what you carried in. But we're in this predicament that, that uh, we often find ourselves in where we've left behind this trail of stuff, this trail of garbage. And uh, everywhere we go, we leave evidence that we've been there, right? Sometimes it's garbage. Sometimes it's trash. Sometimes we, we'd rather not look behind and see what we've left. But hopefully, there are times when we've left evidence of something good. And certainly, as followers of Jesus, we want to leave a trail, not of garbage, not of bad stuff, but we want to leave a trail of Jesus everywhere we go. And, and that's for sure been what Paul has done on this missionary journey. And I don't think there's any place where that, that truth is bigger than than in the city of Ephesus. We see just Paul and, and his, his colleagues in ministry leaving this trail of Jesus that impacts the church and the world for years after their trip to Ephesus. We can leave a trail of Jesus everywhere we go. And I think in Acts chapter 19, the story of Paul in Ephesus, in Acts chapter 19, the first 20 verses, it teaches us three avenues, three kind of roads, three avenues to leaving this trail of Jesus behind us. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to Acts chapter 19. We're going to explore these first 20 verses. We're going to think about this in terms of three avenues, and I think we'll read the scripture as we discuss each avenue. All right. The first avenue is, is just baptism. We, we need to think about baptism, this unique way we say yes to Jesus. Let's take a look at the first seven verses here in Acts chapter 19. This is what God's Word says. 
And it happened that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So Paul shows up here in, in, in Ephesus, in verse 1, and it happened that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. Craig did a a great job last week of of telling us about Paul's adventures in Corinth, and it was in Corinth that Paul met uh, some friends who became important in his ministry uh, going forward, Priscilla and Aquila, and and, uh, and, and so he he worked with them in Corinth, and then uh, eventually Paul leaves Corinth with Priscilla and Aquila, and they go to Ephesus. They they stop in some different places. This uh, little city of Sincrea, they stop, and we get this weird story about Paul shaving his head for a vow. We're not sure what that vow was about, but we see Paul's commitment uh, to to following after Jesus, and he keeps that vow, shaves his head, and he, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. And while Priscilla and Aquila are working with the church, they founded in Ephesus that this guy by the name of Apollos comes through town. And Apollos is described as an eloquent speaker. He's from Alexandria. Alexandria is sort of the, uh, you know, the the center of of intellectualism in the ancient world. And so so maybe we can gather, I don't know if everybody from Alexandria was really smart or whatever, but but maybe we can kind of think of of Apollos in this way. And and he spoke boldly in the synagogue, Scripture tells us. That's the same word we're going to hear described of, of Paul speaking in the synagogue in Ephesus. And I'm not sure if anywhere we get, I, I'd have to go back and look, maybe we do, we, we get this description of Paul as an eloquent speaker. To me, it, it's just sort of this little distinction here where we know that Paul was sharp. I mean, Paul as a debater, Paul as a guy who lays out the facts, Paul as a, as a worker of rhetoric was at the top of his game. He was an orator of orators. I'm not sure if this means that he was a smooth talker, but he had all his ducks in a row. And and he was able to convince people with this uh, speaking boldly. That's what that phrase uh, infers. And and Apollos is described not only as, as having his ducks in a row, but as an eloquent speaker. He's kind of able to to convince people and persuade people, kind of a you know, the salesman kind of mentality. And, and so uh, Apollos works like this, and, and he's described in that way. He preaches boldly, but he uh, is a little inadequate in his preaching and teaching his doctrine of baptism. And, and while he was in Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila teach him more fully. That's what Scripture tells us. And then they send Apollos on his way, and he goes to Corinth, and we kind of get this swap of preachers. Okay, this is over a long period of time, but Paul leaves Corinth, and he's going to end up in Ephesus for a while, and Apollos leaves Ephesus and ends up in Corinth for a while. And uh, having been more fully instructed by Priscilla and Aquila before he gets there. What happens in verse 1 and 19 is uh, chapter... Chapter 19, verse 1, Paul shows up in Ephesus, and, uh, and he meets these disciples of Apollos. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who has come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then Paul laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So he meets these 12 disciples, and for some reason, in, in verse 2, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were, when you were baptized? 
It's sort of a weird question to ask somebody, and it, it kind of leads to another question. It prompts another question. Why in the world would Paul ask these guys that question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And the only conclusion I can come to is that he saw something missing in the, the testimony, the life lived out of these 12 disciples. I'm not sure exactly what that was, but he saw something missing that led him to this conclusion that maybe, you know, they, they aren't indwelled by the Holy Spirit. If you've ever been to an Explore Wallula class, you know that we talk about followers of Jesus needing to know some things. Jesus expects his followers to know some stuff, to have a grip, grip and grasp of some theology, some doctrine, some teaching. He expects us to know some stuff, and he expects us to do some stuff. He wants us to be about some activity in the world, but then he also wants us to, to be this kind of person. And, and to, to describe the, the person that Jesus expects his followers to be, we read out this list that we call the fruit of the Spirit. And it's one of the list, lists in Scripture that when you read it, it, it at least it's one of those uh, lists that makes me sort of gasp for air. I just gulp just a little bit. You know, it's just a little hiccup once in a while that, that I read that list and I think, oh man, it, it, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And you read that list and at least for me, I gulp a little bit because I, I don't focus on the things that, oh yeah, you, you can see those things lived out in my life and it's easy for me to know. I focus on those ones where, whoa, you know, that's what that whole self-control, the joy thing, whatever it is, right? The peace thing, whatever it is in our life where you go, I'm struggling with that right now. And maybe it's the fruit of the Spirit in these guys' life. I'm not sure. that Maybe Paul looked at them and said, nah, this isn't, this isn't so evident. You know, maybe they were really anxious. Maybe they were living without joy. Maybe, maybe they were exercising no self-control. I'm not sure what was going on, but something stood out to Paul about these guys' lives. Maybe it wasn't the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Perhaps it was the exercise of the Spirit in their life. Sort of the, the way the Spirit works in us and through us to share the love of Jesus with other people. Sometimes we think of that as, as giftedness. And in those three areas, know, be, and do, and explore Wallula, that's the do stuff. That's the, that's the stuff like, hey, you need to be worshiping together and studying the Bible together and living in biblical community. You need to be, you need to be praying and you need to be serving others. Maybe this, this do in the life of these guys wasn't so evident. Perhaps they weren't serving others. They weren't living out the Spirit in their everyday interactions with other folks. And for sure, we want to be about that do here at Wallula as well. We want to know that that no is important. It's just that sometimes, I, I won't use the word followers of Jesus, sometimes church people get really caught up in the no. Like, we, we just want to know more and more and more, and we think, I, I can't really do anything until I know enough. And, and the, the truth is that as long as we're drawing breath, right, we ought to be learning more about who our Heavenly Father is. As long as we're drawing breath, we ought to be, we ought to be learning something new from this guidebook of the Bible, Right? There's too much for anyone alive on this planet to say, I got it. And so, consequently, it's impossible for us to wait until we know enough to be or do who Jesus expects us to be or do. And so we, we better get started. We better do. We, we better get started on, on relying on the Spirit to make us new from the inside out so we can live with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There's all sorts of ways here at Wallula where you can, you can participate in living out that Spirit in everyday relationships, where you can do, practice some of these gifts of the Spirit. And, and I, I just want to fill you in so you have it on your calendar. Last year, with our United as One church partner churches, we, we served in Leavenworth and Lansing school districts in the fall and then in the spring, and we're going to do that again this year. And so 
On November 1st, we're going to have a serve day in the Leavenworth School District, and you're going to hear more information about how you can be a part of that and, and serve on that day if you're available. There's going to be notes where you can write to encourage teachers and folks in that school district again. We, we encourage you when those notes come out, we want you to write notes to, to your the school teachers you know and are, are you know, the, your kids' school teachers, whether they're in Leavenworth or otherwise, we're going to have a whole list of teachers from Leavenworth, though, and we want to encourage them, and we, we just want to do and, and be and, and share the love of Jesus in our community, and, and that's one way we can do that. And so uh, Paul recognized that something was missing in these guys. And so, so he asked them, you know, what happened when you were baptized? Did you know, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul fills them in, just like Priscilla and Aquila uh, taught Apollos more thoroughly about baptism and who Jesus is and that relationship there. Paul dives in with these guys. And what happened when they heard this? They were baptized. They said, yes. They're like, this, this relationship with the Holy Spirit, we need more of that. And they gave in to that teaching. They gave in to Jesus, and they were baptized. Sometimes we struggle with this, and I'm not sure why. There's, baptism is for sure really important in the New Testament. 18 times or more it's used in the book of Acts, 77 times overall in the New Testament. We talk about, the New Testament talks about baptism an awful lot. And there is a unique relationship between baptism, salvation, and the Holy Spirit. All right, no matter how you cut it, no matter how you slice it, no matter how thin you want to cut up the deli meat, it's all, it's all there together somehow. You, you can't escape it. And for sure, since the beginning when Jesus started talking about baptism, the Holy Spirit's connected to baptism. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, we call it the Great Commission, right? Jesus has this big plan for his church, for his followers. He says, I need you to go and do what? Make disciples. And how do you make disciples? Well, you teach them everything I've taught you. But he separates out from this. He says, teach them everything. And then he separates out and lists specifically, oh, I need you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teach them to do everything that I've taught you. What's the end promise of the Great Commission? How's that end? Oh, it ends by Jesus saying, I'll be with you always to the very end of the ages. How's Jesus with us always to the very end of the, the ages? Well, the Holy Spirit moves into our life. He sends this helper, this advocate in, into the church, into his believer's life. And the Holy Spirit indwells us. Hey, make disciples, baptizing them. I'll be with you always. The Spirit, Peter preaches this message at Pentecost. They're cut to the heart, the audience is. He says, they say, what should we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just over and over and over. We could, we could go on and make a longer list. There's, the spirit is tied in some way to baptism. I know it kind of gets messy. It even gets messy here in this passage. They're, they're baptized, and then it, it seems like in the English, this isn't so clear in the Greek, but it seems like in the English anyway, that they're baptized, and then Paul lays hands on them, and they start speaking in tongues, and so we, we assume that the Holy Spirit shows up when he lays hands on them. I think there's some answers for this, and my personal conviction is, is that the gifts of the Spirit show up when Paul lays hands on them. They start to speak in tongues as evidence that the Holy Spirit has arrived, that the Holy Spirit indwells them at baptism, and the gifts of the Spirit show up as evidence that, hey, this is really for real. That's why that happened at Cornelius' house a long time ago in the book of Acts. We got these Gentiles, they're being baptized. Is, the, you know, is this for real? Yes. They're including God's family. Salvation is real for these Gentiles. The Holy Spirit's a part of it all. Yeah, the Holy Spirit shows up at, at baptism. And here it shows up kind of with this laying on of hands. The, the gifts do. And I guess, I get that it's a little messy. 
Like, I, I wish it was a little neater and, you know, A, B, and C, and D, and we just put it all together and every time and whatever. And you have to get a little bit comfortable here with this idea that the Holy Spirit is God. And so the Holy Spirit gets to do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants. Like, the Holy Spirit gets to do this stuff, not, not us. Oh, the, the best we can do is, is try to figure out how do, how do we get on board you know, how do, we, how do we make sure that we are a part of the team? How are we submitting to Jesus as Lord of our life? I've been reading this book. It's by Eugene Peterson, and he talks about grace, this idea of receiving God's grace. And, he, 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 you know, it's interesting that you read the first chapter of the letter written to the Ephesians by Paul. Uh, the book of Ephesus, read through that first chapter, and the first chapter of, of the book of Ephesians just talks about how, how big God's grace is, how immeasurable his grace is, right? How rich his mercy is. There's all this language of just how amazing God's grace is. And, and Peterson says, how do we receive that? He said, well, it takes this, this acquired passivity, and we read words like that, like passive, and for most of us, that's not, it's hard for us to hear that. Like, especially as Americans, I think, there's still a little bit, I, I suppose this is waning in America, but there's still some of that pioneer spirit in us. Uh, mostly, we kind of think, I can fix it, I can handle it, I can manage it, I'll get there on my own. And, and the truth is, every single person, every person, person who's a part of God's creation, I'm pretty sure that's all of us, we've got the same problem, right? And it's sin. And sin is a really, really big problem. And too many of us, myself included, at different times thinks, think to ourselves, I can figure it out. I can leave it behind. I can exercise enough self-discipline. And here's the truth. We can't. We are in desperate need of a Savior. We absolutely require the newness that the Holy Spirit brings into our life. In order to, to receive that, we've got to acquire this passivity, which is just kind of this weird way that Peterson is saying we need to submit to who Jesus is. Baptism is, by the way, just this beautiful picture of that, isn't it? I mean, you've seen baptisms here. You've experienced baptisms here. You know that when, when somebody says yes to Jesus, they're trusting somebody to lower them under the water. And then that person has the power to hold them under the water. But they're believing and they're trusting that instead they'll lift them up out of the water, huh? I mean, that's not a completely natural thing. And, and the, the, the physical part of baptism, it's, it's a picture, absolutely, but there's something bigger going on there. In the spiritual, I'm going to use the same very high intellectual word that I used at 9 o'clock. The spiritual stuff that's happening at baptism is huge. It's the same picture of submission, that we're being buried to sin in the water, and we're being raised up to this new life that's only available through the Spirit. And so when they heard this, these 12 men said, got to have it. I'm on board. Let's go get in the pool. Let's go get in the river. Let's find some water. Let's be baptized. And maybe some of you are in that place where you need to say yes to Jesus for the first time don't wait. I mean, we want to help you to do that. On this welcome home card, just write the word baptism. I'm going to talk to you this week. We're going to, we're going to take those steps so that you can say yes, so you, you can acquire that passivity necessary, so that you can submit to who Jesus is and the difference that he wants to make in your life. Man, how beautiful is that? The first avenue to leaving a trail of Jesus behind is, is getting on the team, being a part of the family, saying yes to him, receiving him in baptism. Oh, by the way, this is free. I shouldn't say this. This is free. Like here at Wallula, we don't practice infant baptism. You know, we, we practice a believer's baptism. And I think this is a picture of that as well. These guys, they didn't know enough 
before. I don't think there's any such thing as having this perfect depth of knowledge before you're baptized, but these guys couldn't make the decision before because they didn't know. It's the reason that we don't baptize infants, right? Because they can't know. It's not their decision, it's mom and dad's decision, and that's a good decision that mom and dad is making to raise kids to know Jesus. But that indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens when we say yes to Jesus, when we acknowledge who he is as Lord and Savior. Uh, Second avenue is evangelism. Once we get on board uh, on that team, uh, part of that family, we need to leave Jesus behind. That's evangelism. It's church word evangelism. It's a church word that just means to share the story of Jesus. Let's look at verses 8 and 10. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, that's the church, that's followers of Jesus, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus, thus continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. When I think of sharing the story of Jesus, I think about two things, that, especially here in this passage. At the very beginning, Paul shows up in Ephesus, and where does he go? It's the same pattern. Every place he goes, if there's a synagogue, he goes to the synagogue. Why? Because he wants to engage with like-minded people. He wants to engage with folks who are close or already on board with Jesus. And the best place to find them is the synagogue. It's what happened last week in Corinth when he's looking for this place. And so he can meet with Aquila and Priscilla. And now he goes to the synagogue and and he just steps out and he does it. He takes this step of of, of faith and he just gets started. Uh, So much of the time we we struggle with this idea of sharing Jesus because we we don't have a team around us. We haven't gotten started. It's why we've been talking so much about small groups. Some of you have been reluctant. You haven't yet signed up. You haven't yet showed up. Man, take that first step and show up. Get started just like Paul. He shows up at the synagogue and then he, he speaks boldly. That's the same word that's used to describe Apollos. And so they've had years of this kind of bold preaching in the synagogue in Ephesus, and and sooner or later, they they get to a point where, okay, we've had enough of this, and they chase Paul out of the synagogue. And where does Paul go when he gets chased out of the synagogue? He goes, you know, kind of next door again to this hall, this meeting room. Somebody, Tyrannus, rented it to him or whatever. Most scholars think, actually, that he gave it to him for free. That they, They think, Paul, this is sort of interesting, I think, that they gave this space to Paul for this worship service Bible study for free because he used it between the hours of 11 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. This is not just the lunch hour, but this is time when when people would, would take a nap. Siesta sort of idea. Everybody shut down. And so, you know, some scholars of the ancient world said that there were more people awake at 1 a.m. in the ancient world than there were at 1 p.m. Everybody was taking a nap. And so the scholars think he, Paul got to use this space for free because ain't nobody coming at nap time. And Paul shows up, and he just sticks with it. And, and I just wonder, was the room full that first time? Paul said, hey, we're having Bible study at lunch and nap time. And it just everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'm on board. I'm not sure if it was. But eventually, after two years, Scripture says, Everybody in Asia, not just Ephesus, but everybody around heard this story. Maybe you think that's hyperbole. Maybe it is. But Ephesus becomes sort of this really important city and church in the New Testament. Seven books of the New Testament are written to or about in regards to to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. The apostle John moves to Ephesus, probably with Jesus' mother Mary, and and he lives and ministers in Ephesus. We think probably the the gospel of John was written in Ephesus. First, second, third John are written two churches in the area in Ephesus. You get to the second chapter of the book of Revelation. You remember those seven churches that receive letters? Jesus has some things to say to them. You know where those seven churches are? Asia Minor, Asia. You know, Ephesus is one of those churches and then churches all around the area. You know, you get Paul's letter 
to the Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, while Timothy was preaching and pastoring in Ephesus, or written, uh, you know, about the churches in Ephesus, it becomes this big deal. And, and so to say that everybody in Asia heard, maybe that's kind of hyperbole. Well, I mean, the end of the story says a lot of people heard this. A lot of people gave in to this story because Paul wouldn't quit. I talked to you earlier in the service about those uh, invitation cards. They're on your chair every week, and I'd love for you to take those inv invitation and just put them in your pocket, put them in your Bible, put them in your purse right now. Take, those, take that home, and, and I want you to just share that invitation with somebody this week. Next week is a great week to invite somebody to worship with you. We're beginning a brand new series. Just suck them in for that whole eight-week series. I, I, right away they will, I'm sure. Invite them to be a part of church next week. It's going to be a great time. A great time to do that. And, and as I'm telling you this story, some of you, you're thinking, well, this name is popping in my head. It, it probably is, all right? I just want to contend that it's Holy Spirit prompting you right now that this is the person I ought to be thinking and looking for ways to invite to worship with me next week, and I'd love to be a part of that. And the only way I know that I can really absolutely be a part of that is if you'll just say, my one, on your welcome home card. Just write my one and then write that person's first name. And I just want to pray for you and that person this week. All right, that, that's how I can absolutely help. If there's some other way I can help, you talk to me and I'll do my best. But I know I can pray for you and this person this week. And so just write that down on that welcome home card. And, and maybe it's a person that you've asked, you know, two weeks ago or a month ago or three months ago. And it wasn't right. They said, ah, not right now or I'm busy or I'm on vacation or whatever. And I just would ask you to follow Paul's example for two years Folks, at nap time, don't call them this afternoon, but Paul did at nap time. Said, hey, come to this Bible study. Hey, come to this worship service. Invite them to worship with you. Invite them to the, the, your, your small group. Invite them to be a part of, 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 you know, that, of youth group, of jam. Invite them to be a part of those things. Paul stuck with it. And he shared the word of Jesus, and, and all of Asia heard. Let, let's get to the third avenue, which is abstinence. There's probably some stuff we need to stay away from. And uh, certainly that was evident in the church in Ephesus. This is, this is kind of this third little story. is just, it, it, uh, it's so fun to me. Verse 11 says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of Jewish high priests named Siva were doing this. And, and, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear, fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord was extolled. And many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them inside of all, and they counted the value of them and found it to it came to 50,000 pieces of silver so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily uh, the, the revival breaks out that's the only way you can describe this and the result of that revival is that people more and more people are saying yes to Jesus and when they realize the the power the influence the difference that Jesus and the Holy Spirit make in their life they're like we've got to get away from this other stuff that we thought was okay, that isn't okay in our life. We've got to run away from the New Testament. When it talks about sin and what to do with it, often says, flee, run, get as far away as you can. And that's what happens when revival breaks out. Verse 11 says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles. I want to know what the ordinary miracles were, but they were doing extraordinary miracles. And all I think that means is that the folks in Ephesus, they'd never seen anything like this. This kind of reminds us earlier in the book of Acts when people were bringing their sick friends and they just wanted Paul's, or, or uh, Peter's uh, shadow to fall on them in case that might heal them. Or you remember the woman who's 
in the crowd with Jesus, and she just thinks, if I can worm my way through this crowd and I can just touch Jesus' cloak, then I'll be healed. And sure enough, that's what happens. That's this kind of miracle. They're taking poles, this word, the Greek word for handkerchief and apron. We don't really know what those were, but they're poles work clothes. You know, that's the best we can figure. I remember a long time ago when I was in high school, I worked for this lawn maintenance company, and I remember mowing yards all day, and I'd be so hot and sweaty, and I'd come home, and I was in high school, you know, and, and so uh, don't ask Sherry, but I probably don't do this anymore, and I just peeled off the sweaty shirt, and I'd throw it in a corner, and it was so gross, it would kind of stick, poof, you know, in the corner. And that, look, I don't know how sweaty Paul was, but they're taking his work clothes and they're like putting them over people in hopes that this miracle would happen and then miracles happened. The Ephesians had never seen anything like this. The church, uh, the city of Ephesus was this spiritual center in Asia. They were all about magic. In fact, the, uh, you read to the end of chapter 19 and there's a riot that happens in Ephesus or a near riot that happens in Ephesus. Why? It's why we get this list of, uh, took all these magic books and it cost us much money because there was this temple, this huge temple in Ephesus and people came, pilgrim made a pilgrimage to Ephesus all the time, and one of the huge economic drivers in Ephesus was selling religious pagan artifacts. They sold little idols, statues. People would come, and they'd take home this little idol, and they'd pay money, and folks came to know Jesus. They turned in their magic books, and they quit buying idols. So when everybody in Asia heard, they stopped traveling to Ephesus. They stopped buying the, these religious pagan trinkets. And folks, they got mad. My income has taken a dip, and I don't like that. And so there's this riot that breaks out. It's sort of this amazing transformation, this, this, you see Paul leaving this trail of Jesus everywhere he goes. These folks give in to Jesus, and they say yes, and then they go home, and they're looking in their literal closets. You know, kind of metaphoric, in literal closets. And they pull out these magic books. They're spell books. That's what they were. They're like, we can't be doing this stuff anymore. There's one true God there's one power source, and it's become so clear to us. It's, it's Holy Spirit. It's Jesus. It's Father God. This is it. This is one true God. We can't have anything to do with this. I don't know what it is, right? But I bet there's something in every one of our lives that if we looked into that metaphor closet or maybe that literal closet, we need to haul it out and get rid of it. Right? I know we read this, and I'm not a big fan of like, you know, I remember I grew up in an era when the thing was, uh, you can't listen to any secular music. We called it secular music. You know, it wasn't Christian, and there were churches, not my, I never did this, right? I'm not a me, big music, I'm a bad example, but I never did this. I, I'm not a fan. Like, hey, we're going to bring all our CDs or records or whatever and smash them. It, Look, I don't know what it is in your life. I get that probably whatever it is, it's really a heart issue, and you need to get your heart right, but sometimes the only way to get the heart right is to get rid of the stuff. I'll give you one example I thought of. I've just been, you know, we're leading up to this election in November, and there's so many people that are so anxious that one thing or another is going to happen in this election. And they're worried, one side with the other side, and everybody's worried about what might happen. And, and maybe you're in that place where you're so anxious about this. And I would just, I would just ask you to you know, let God have that. And you know, whether that's, you think of that as abstinence, I just want to get away from this. I'm not saying don't vote or don't participate. Just let go of that angst and worry. And anytime you fast from something... I think you need to fill up that space or the fast is just a diet, right? You need to fill that up with, with, with something. Luke, Luke said, you know, the, the, the good man brings good out of the good sort up in his heart. The evil man brings evil out of the evil sort up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, 
right? And so if we're getting rid of stuff, that's really good, but let's fill it up with something that makes a difference. And so over these next eight weeks, I have a Bible reading plan. I've got physical copies, hard copies on this next step station. It's on your app. You can find this five days a week. I, it just starts in Genesis, ends in Revelation. You're not reading the entire Bible, right? It's an overview of kind of God's big plan. And I would just ask, hey, if you're worried about that or not, you know, let's pray for this election, but let's just pray that, that everyone, that the church would remember that we serve the one true king, that God, Jesus, Lord of everything, placed far above everything, is really, really, really big. And our government, not so much, right? That kings and kingdoms will fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Now you start that reading plan and maybe you can leave behind some of that worry and, and anxiousness and, 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 and just stay away from some of that stuff. And maybe it's something else in your life, right? I don't know what it is. Maybe you need to get rid of you know, whatever's showing up on the computer screens or uh, whatever, whatever's happening in this relationship or that, you need to get rid of it. Well, I, I was thinking about, you know, these guys climbing mountains, and, and uh, we went to visit my daughter Zoe in Manhattan. There's a place in Manhattan called the Top of the World. I don't think that's really true, but that's what it's called. And, and we went there, and we, we, we walked up this hill, and, and Sherry posted these pictures on social media, and she said, oh, we, we took this hike in, in Manhattan, and there's pictures of us smiling, and, and I'm even smiling on this hike because it wasn't really a hike. We walked up a hill. And so we walked up the hill, and we're standing there, and she's taking pictures, and then, you know, other people are commenting. And one of my friends, this person who works on staff for the time being, commented, they said, oh, Clayton, that's my son, you can see him in the picture, he said, oh, Clayton, please take care of your dad, right, and I thought, we're walking up a stinking hill, you know, I know there's no logs anyway, I'm not lying down to die here, it'd be in the dirt, I'm not doing that, come on, so, I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, it's okay, and, and then I thought, yeah, but this is true. This is true. We all need, at some point in time, somebody to help take care of us. Right? And for sure, we're all in the same boat. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need help. We need a Savior. We need to say yes to Jesus in baptism. We need to share that story with the folks around us. And probably, probably we ought to start living like nobody else around us. There's probably something we need to get rid of and kind of throw it in that bonfire, at least metaphorically. Let's stand and worship him right now.